Welcome to the Superheroes Everyday podcast. I'm Danny Horn. Thank you for joining us. Superheroes Everyday is a comedy blog about the history of superhero movies, starting with Superman the movie in 1978 and telling the story of how superhero blockbusters became the world's most efficient way to painlessly separate money from the public and then give it to entirely the wrong people. On the blog, I'm writing about the movies in release order, but here on the podcast, we'll be covering pivotal moments in superhero movie history, today addressing the 2016 Festival of Self-Sabotage, Suicide Squad. Now, I know your time is precious, so I am using the Sid Field three-act structure to break up the episode. This is Act 1 of Suicide Squad, and then I will be releasing Act 2 and Act 3 later on in the week. And now I want to introduce my guest, Evan Brady. Hey, Evan. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it's really great to have you. Uh, Evan has been a good friend of the show. It's true, since episode one. I'm, I'm a, a, a shitty movie aficionado, <laughs> so I'm surprised I didn't see Suicide Squad in theaters because it had that stink on it. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, let's talk about Suicide Squad. To start with, there's a lot of backstory to this film that might actually be more interesting than the movie itself. Written and directed by David Ayer, he was mostly known for action thriller movies, mostly about cops and soldiers. Uh, he wrote Training Day and in 2001 and co-wrote Fast and the Furious, a bunch of other things. In 2012, he made the police procedural drug trafficking action thriller End of Watch, which was very successful. And in 2014, the federal agent drug trafficking action thriller Sabotage, which was very much not successful. And Warner Brothers, for reasons known only to themselves and the dark gods they pray to, were under the sway of Zack Snyder and his curious concept that comic book movies should be dimly lit, violent destruction porn. Snyder was currently working on Batman v Superman and Justice League, and they were really into it. And so that's why they hired David Ayer in 2014 to come and write, write and direct a movie about DC supervillains coming together to bicker with each other and fight scary monsters. They had a, a good cast and a workable <laughs> script. The filmmaking process was super weird, and we'll talk about that later on. But the important thing that I want to discuss right at the top is why Warner Brothers panicked and reshot a lot of the movie. This is basically a tale of two trailers. There was the Comic-Con trailer in July 2015, and then the Bohemian Rhapsody trailer in January 2016. Yeah, I, I, on your recommendation, I watched them just last night. And I remember seeing the Comic-Con trailer when it first hit the internet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, everybody was, was anticipating what was Jared Leto's Joker going to be. Yeah. What he was going to look like, what he was going to sound like. And, uh, and then we found out, and it was very disappointing. <laughs> is, there, is there a lot of joke? I think there's, like, there's definitely there's a Joker line. Uh, he's at the very end. It's the scene when he's putting the electrodes on Harley's face or right. on, her, on her head. He says, I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to hurt you a lot. Or... Yeah. And then he kind of drools. And so how would you describe the, the reaction that you had that, you know, comic fans had? Uh, I'm trying to remember. It was not it was not a good reaction. I remember that much. Of course, it's, the, you know, Internet fanboys are either going to be that was the greatest thing ever. That's yeah. the worst thing ever. And, uh, you know, it's it's neither. It's really slow is the thing. And it's sort of quiet yeah, and dour. sad. Yeah. 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 The first half is just like sad people being in prison. And then the second half is just people running around in the dark, shooting guns and destroying helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> this movie hates helicopters. Yeah. And Ayer later on, he, he described like that that was the tone that he wanted. This is a quote, methodical, layered, complex, beautiful and sad, <laughs> which is absolutely what the public wants. <laughs> Is yeah, superhero yeah. movies that are methodical and layered and sad. So they got kind of like this perplexed feedback from the Comic-Con trailer. So the studio got a different team to make a fun trailer, which they released in January. And that was set entirely to Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> yes. Evan, what did you think about that one? That's a better trailer. <laughs> and that movie looks really fun. The weird right? thing about it is, yeah, the trailer's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But when I kind of examined it, like... The fun is mostly just the editing and the music, like oh, just absolutely. putting images up in time to the music. They And they do that excellently, like the shell casings hitting the ground to the yeah. beat of the songs and stuff like that. It's very impressive. But yeah, uh, yeah the movie is not that. But it, it's yeah, it turns out that that was not. And especially at that point, that that's not how the movie was. There's a couple of, of funny Harley Quinn moments, which I read. Somebody said we're actually like the only two funny moments in the film at this point. It's like they've mm -hmm. used all of the jokes, which amounted to two. 
And then also, I thought this was interesting. They cherry pick a couple lines of dialogue. There's the Joker saying, I can't wait to show you my toys. And Enchantress saying, let's do something fun. To kind of imply that the movie was playful and fun, which it was not. I don't think either of those lines are in the film. At least it the, might theatrical not be. Re- the theatrical yeah. release, yeah. The audience response to to this kind of upbeat trailer, like you and I are saying, like it was much improved. People thought it was a lot more fun and really liked it. And so that confirmed a suspicion that the studio heads were worried about. And then two movies came out that really told them which way the wind was blowing. There was February, In February 2016, Deadpool came out, which was violent antihero story, just like Suicide Squad. But it was a comedy. It was not methodical and layered and sad. It was a little layered, but I wouldn't call it methodical and sad. Uh, and people really loved it. And then a month later, in March, Warner Brothers released Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, which was not received well at all. Because it was another dark Zack Snyder superhero film nobody asked for. <laughs> so that got bad reviews. That underperformed. And so now the WB execs are seeing the obvious truth that when we watch superhero movies, what we want is for them to be upbeat and fun. So they panicked. It is five months until the release date of Suicide Squad. And they told David Ayer he needed to reshoot a whole bunch of things. And basically they wanted to like restructure the whole film. They wanted fun character moments and more jokes and a different ending. And Jeff Johns wrote new pages for Ayer to reshoot. They did $10 million of additional photography. And basically, they made two different movies. David Ayer had his version that he cut together. The studio made their own version. And so what they did was they tested both versions. And the testing showed that they were tied, which is not a thing that usually happens. It was like 50-50. People liked some things about Ayer's cut better. And they like some things about the studio cut better. So they decided to make a consensus version, which is like a combination of the two different versions of the movie, which is just about the worst possible way to handle that. Well, you know, if you've got two uh, two uh, jigsaw puzzles mm-hmm. and one's missing a piece and the other's missing a piece, you just mix <laughs> them up, right? Yeah, you just put them together. Yeah. What, you, what you'll get will be interesting. Sure. Yeah, for sure. And you just you just hit it with a mallet until it, it's... Until opening weekend. Yeah. (laughs) And so the movie that we are watching, you can kind of tell it is not seamless. This was not a seamless process as they figured out what they were going to do. So just quickly running the numbers. Suicide Squad actually did okay at the box office. It was number nine for the year, which was just a little bit under Batman v Superman. 325 million domestic box office. Based on that, we would actually call it a success. But both of the DC movies got savaged by the reviews which really affected just how people saw the whole franchise. Batman v Superman got 29% on Rotten Tomatoes. Suicide Squad got 26%. Well, let's get into Act 1. As we said, the response to that Bohemian Rhapsody trailer was great, and the studio cut kind of overcompensated based on that by <laughs> scoring the movie predominantly with radio hits. So I know you have you have thoughts about <laughs> I do. these music I have. tracks. Yeah, so I this is one of the main things I remembered about the movie. And so I kept a running count while I was rewatching it. The theatrical cut of Suicide Squad has 17 pop songs in it, <laughs> not counting the two in the closing credits. I am so glad that you counted. That's amazing. <laughs> 17. Yeah. And considering the last one is Bohemian Rhapsody, uh you couldn't put them on a single CD if they wanted to. Yeah. If they were still I don't think they were still selling soundtrack albums that much in uh in 2016 but oh they work as guardians so yeah, you know, yeah. a whole bunch of, of cds at the time so it starts out with the animals uh doing house of the rising sun and really just what you see is like they don't trust the movie to set its own tone so they are pretty directive about this the first half of this movie is assembling the team mm-hmm. which is usually a, a formula that you can't really screw up too badly unless you decide to put 13 different characters <laughs> in it and you introduce them multiple times in yes. different ways. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so the opening here, actually, I read the novelization because... <laughs> Did you? <laughs> on, on purpose. Because what I read was that the novelization was actually closer to Ayer's original vision. So that's why I went and read it. Yeah, this is probably based on the, the screenplay that they started with. The third act seems to be like the, the, the theatrical third act, which I think is not yep. Ayer's. But I think like... One thing for sure, I think was completely different. I think this was the opening in the air cut. Uh, it opens with Dr. June Moon, archaeologist and dumbass. <laughs> the worst the jungle. Yes. Sorry. 
<laughs> we, we we're all going to say the same thing. Everybody who watched the movie thought the same thing, right? Yeah, this is, like you're not being Lara Croft here. You're not being Indiana Jones. You walk into a cave and get possessed. I mean, she pick, she picks up this ancient artifact and immediately snaps the head right <laughs> off of it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But it makes sense to spend a little time on that. Like one of the reasons why I think she looks like such a dumbass is because they just like take this part and they just throw it into the middle of a whole bunch of other intros because she's going to become the villain of the movie. And so you should probably do something with her that marks her character as specifically important as opposed to what they do in the finished movie, which is basically it makes her kind of incidental. And she gradually becomes the villain without you really even remembering that that she exists. So instead of going into the jungle, we start out with Deadshot, with Will Smith, which is which is also actually not a bad answer. We're locked up in a, a maximum security prison with Will Smith. Not a terrible idea, because Will Smith, I'm this is not controversial to say, Will Smith is very charming. Yeah, I I will say I have absolutely nothing to complain about with Will Smith in this movie, or really probably any movie. Yeah. I mean they they paid him a lot of money, he showed up and he Will Smithed all over the place and <laughs> he really did. He is cool. His his responses to things are always kind of interesting. He seems relatively sane. Yeah. As these characters go. They also here at the top, they establish Ike Barinholtz as the mean prison guard. Um, and basically in like the first half of the movie, whenever they need somebody to be mean, they they go and get Ike Barinholtz to come in and be mean to people. Mm -hmm. It's good for him. It is. I like I like when you see a comedy person get one of these like small or in this case pretty big roles in a in a, in a big budget movie. It's a nice paycheck and being kind of dark and getting a, a chance to to not be entirely the funny guy. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't help that he and like Joker's main henchman look basically identical. Do they? I think it's, I don't know who the Joker's main henchman is. <laughs> it's like I, you might have thought it was like Baron. Holtz. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the only one I know is the panda guy. Oh, I love the guy wearing the panda cop. He's in yeah. multiple scenes, too. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, where's that spinoff? What I understand from the novelization, he was actually in a lot more. Like, there were several <laughs> scenes, and he even had dialogue. They made they made an action figure of Panda Did Man. They? Yes. Oh, I can't wait to get to that part. <laughs> yeah, I didn't... Um, I'll have plenty of complaints about Leto's Joker, but his gang seems pretty fun, right? They do, yeah. One, of them one guy a, wearing the Batman. Batman. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that is really fun. I like that a lot. So now we go to another cell in this maximum security prison, and we find Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn, which I think is the thing they really nailed in this movie. I think also not controversial. Well, I have to point out, you said cell, but she's in a cage. Yes, she is. Inside of a larger cage. Yes. Inside of like a warehouse. Mm -hmm. it, uh, there's no visible bed or toilet or uh any sort of no she sleeps on the floor human right <laughs> <laughs> they treat they treat croc better it seems like yeah but i guess the the idea is she is so dangerous this is also a pop song number two i think in this oh, what was this song <laughs> leslie gore's you don't own me which has been right. stuck in my head the last week because it's a good it's a good song and not a bad choice like, I yeah. think I, I mentioned to you, I'm surprised they didn't go with crazy. Yeah. I mean, maybe they couldn't afford it. They they really do say the word crazy. They really make sure that we understand that Harley Quinn is crazy in this scene. <laughs> yes. As well as throughout the movie, like specifically pointing out everyone keeps saying it about her. Well, yeah, because they have to say it because the movie doesn't really demonstrate it very well. She seems a little more balanced than, say, Captain Boomerang. Or Diablo. Yeah, they kind of, by crazy, they kind of mean funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, she tells jokes. Yeah, and she, like, she, she stands up to people when they threaten her. Oh, women don't do that. That's crazy. And I, I feel like she is just an absolute delight. Every, every frame that she's in, I just think she's so funny, and she's just really alive and really individual and specific. And she was really, she was, she became then the star of the kind of remake that they made in 2021 called the suicide squad when they got James Gunn just basically to do this over again and show everyone, no, you actually can make a really good movie out of this source material. There's another needle drop right here as the introduction for Amanda Waller. Oh yeah. It's uh the stones, right? Sympathy for the devil. Yeah, it is. So like sympathy for the devil is just so on the nose for this character. 
she acts like a the villain of the movie right from the start. You don't need to put a billboard up like that. And yet, and, and yet, yet they do. And yet she's not in enough of the movie because it's Viola Davis and she's great. Yeah. Viola Davis, she's playing, It's this is Waller. She's a government employee of no fixed abode who wants to start <laughs> Task Force X. She's having dinner in a big empty restaurant with a, a general, I guess, with some army dude. Uh, yeah, so there's a, a, a general a general white guy, and <laughs> uh, I assume his, his friend, Colonel White Guy, who's played by David Harbour. Yep, good actor, Not does not actually appear in this film. Yeah, he's in oh, two, maybe two scenes. Yeah. So she's, this is a pitch meeting. She's pitching her plan. They are now aware there are metahumans living among us, and we don't really have a way to fight them if we need to. She says we got lucky with Superman because he shared our values, but the next Superman might not. So Waller's found the worst of the worst, who she can manipulate into becoming a strike force team, which is a terrible idea. But she seems real set on it. And so we get a list of six intros in a row for six main characters. There are a lot of characters in this movie. My count is 13 main <laughs> characters, not counting Slipknot or <laughs> Batman or Deadshot's daughter, not counting Diablo's wife, not counting the soul of Katana's husband, which is still alive inside <laughs> her sword. Like, not counting Panaman, all of that. Uh, uh, are you counting Clint Eastwood's son? Uh, I am counting Clint Eastwood's son, yes, as a character whose name you don't know for a long time. I think it, they call him GQ, right? Yes. Which yep. is like... That's kind of that's kind of on the nose for him. He's, <laughs> he's uh, oh, yeah. the cutie pie that kind of follows Rick Flagg around and doesn't you know do anything until the end. <laughs> but there are... So 13 is just so many characters, and they try to set them all up. We're about to go into a thing where, like, now we know Waller. We're seeing her, mm -hmm. and then they're introducing six people. So they're giving us like seven characters right up front and kind of pretending that that's the whole cast. And later on, they just start slipping in more people <laughs> and saying like throughout the film, basically like, oh, hey, this person's important, too. So it's just so many things. So before we get into this, I want to review the three steps to creating a likable character that the audience will respond to. Three steps. You make a friend, you make a joke, you make something happen. Having a friend in the movie gives the character value in the story world. Like somebody likes this person, so it's okay for us to like them too. Making a joke is a way to signal to the audience that the character understands their job is to entertain us. And then make something happen means they have to deliver some kind of plot point that changes the story because otherwise they're dead weight. And this is hard to do with six characters in a row plus slipping more people in. And Suicide Squad does not accomplish this for many of its characters. And I'm trying to think of who meets the criterion who don't. Well, let's go through them. Let's find out. So we start with Deadshot, a.k.a. Will Smith, who is mm -hmm. a human arsenal. <laughs> uh, he's the best hitman in the world. We see a scene where he's got a mafia hit that requires like a bank shot off a metal plate to kill the guy. <laughs> you know, I got to say, I, I hate guns. Yeah. I hate shooting people. I hate that that guns are the leading cause of death among children in America. But but all the Steadshot shit is really cool. Yeah, they actually right? it's you, you just you hand that gun to Will Smith and all of a sudden shooting people how does he, feels how cool. Does he, how does he do it? Because it even despite a certain incident at the Oscars, he's a famously peaceful guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, this is kind of it's it's a fun twist on that character. It's, he's playing the Will Smith character that he always plays. But this one has this amazing talent. And I think that's kind of part of, of what makes him work is that this is he, he doesn't just shoot people. He has this very special, specific talent where he can just do one bullet. He can take out anybody. And so that's what he does here at the top. We do see him with his daughter going Christmas shopping. And there's sort of like this standard sentimental scene making where where the daughter is just like super innocent and super wholesome and he wants custody. So this is at least so if you, if it's make a friend, make a joke, make something happen, like he's got the friend, which is the daughter. Somebody likes him in this world. He's got the joke because he's real funny during the mafia mm -hmm. hit thing. Mm -hmm. And so the question is then, like, does he is he able to to get his own plot point? Waller gave an anonymous tip, and then here comes Batman. This is this is Ben Affleck Batman from Batman v Superman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the Batman's so big, it looks like he can't tie his shoes by himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, it's interesting. You know, yeah, they make a point of that, that Waller set this up because she wanted Deadshot on her team. Yeah. Yeah, so was Batman just going to ignore it otherwise? <laughs> right, yeah, no, otherwise was, he, he would not have, yeah. They're the world's greatest assa- assassin. He's he's Christmas shopping. Leave him alone. He's not right. anybody right at the moment, yeah. Deadshot is going to shoot Batman, and the little girl jumps in between them and, like, cries. It is, it's hard to say if they're being serious about this little girl or not, because she's the fucking worst. Then there's another super obvious... Needle drop, because we get the Harley Quinn intro, and what are they playing? Super Freak. Yes. Which, we're going to need that in order to know that she's crazy, because it is not enough for somebody to say the word, you're crazy, every five minutes. (laughs) They have to write the word wild card in neon letters in the middle of the screen. She starts out as an extremely blonde psychiatrist at Arkham Asylum, uh, Dr. Harleen Quinzel. And so Waller kind of just walks us very quickly through, like, her patient is the Joker, And in a very, very brief montage, we see she falls in love with the Joker. And then a guy in a panda suit with a machine gun shoots a whole bunch of people. Uh, And that means that the Joker has has taken over the asylum. And so we get the Joker for the first time. The Joker is is like a weird figure in this movie because he was supposed to. For one thing, he was supposed to have a much bigger part. Oh, yeah. In Ayer's original cut. And and for the studio cut, they cut him down and down and down. Yeah, because he's extremely off putting. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and not the way it's not the way they want it to be <laughs> tell me about that oh well okay so is he is he doing a jim carrey impression <laughs> you get that feeling because there's sort of like these moments where he where he officially cuts loose and does it yeah, yeah, does yeah. a joke yeah it's like jim carrey in a baz Luhrmann movie maybe <laughs> yeah something i noticed there's a poster i think it's the dvd blu-ray cover that has uh, it has Leto's Joker on it, and he's barefoot. Have you noticed that? No, I didn't see that. Which means that some makeup person had to paint <laughs> his feet white. Yeah, and he was not good to the makeup people. That's a thing that I know about him. He, he did something horrible to that person. I'm sure of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? as he did to everybody. But the way he looks is very weird. So he's got like green slick back hair, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he is all white, like the Joker's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. So the thing that makes him different from all the other Jokers that we've seen is he has tattoos all over his body, including mm-hmm. on his face. Mm-hmm. And then these like silver capped fangs. He doesn't have real teeth. Yeah, I, I think we're meant to assume that at some point Batman knocked all his teeth out. Yes. Yeah, there's there's backstory but, but that we don't actually get. That's not. Movie. Yeah, that's not in the movie. Yeah. The backstory, which is weirdly alluded to once, is that the Joker apparently killed Robin. Yeah, I think in in BVS, there's a shot of a Robin costume with like a bullet hole in it or something like that. Yeah. So Joker kills Robin, and then as a result of that, Batman punches all of Joker's teeth out. Seems fair. Yeah, but none of that is actually in this movie. No, 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 not at all. So people hated the tattoos. That was the thing. The fans really hated it. Especially he's got one, a tattoo on his forehead that says damage. Damage, yes. Which... Again, as part of this backstory, apparently he like he put that on as like taunting Batman for breaking all of his teeth. But nobody really got it, and it's just kind of terrible. We we see the Joker's goons like drag Dr. Quinzel on a hospital gurney, and she's gonna get electroshock therapy. And then he zaps her with electricity in her brain, and she goes, la la la. Now like now she's just like criminally insane and she's Harley Quinn, and that is how that works. I mean, her origin is always she's the Joker's psych- psychiatrist. And mm-hmm. so the, the only real difference is, does he sway her to his side or does he electroshock her brain? I don't know. I'm not sure which way she's more relatable as a character. Yeah. I mean, either way, she's, she's an abused partner. Either way. Which one gives her more agency? So this was actually a lot more abusive in the original cut. That's one thing that I know is that there were a lot more flashbacks about how badly the Joker treated her. And she had a whole character arc that was about like coming to terms with his abuse and then rejecting him. Mm. But the studio, I think, decided that that was depressing. Mm. Mm -hmm. And Jared Leto's Joker was terrible. And so most of that was just taken out. So then we introduce Boomerang, who is basically a walking Australian accent. Captain Boomerang. Captain Boomerang. 
Yeah, I don't think he 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 earned that rank though. <laughs> So as far as like the make a friend, make a joke thing, mm -hmm. I think he he doesn't have any friends in the movie. He kind of tries and it doesn't work. And I think the the joke that he has is that he has a fetish for pink unicorn dolls, which yeah, is highlighted I, here. It is not very funny. Yeah, I've tried to understand what they were going for, and I just can't fathom <laughs> it at all. Yeah. Most of the movie, he's, he sort of like just lurks around on the fringes and, and says something sarcastic and shakes his head. Which is, that is a character type that you need in this kind of movie, but mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of characters in this movie. One thing I want to point out about Captain Boomerang on my list, he's introduced to ACDC's Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap. <laughs> yes, he is. Which is disgustingly on the nose, yeah. but is exactly what I would have done. <laughs> right. I can't you, even complain about it. <laughs> if, you had, if you had to pick a, a song hit for him, <laughs> yeah. that, that yeah. would have been it. Uh, then there's Diablo, kind of homeboy gangster, uh, who is also secretly a complete fire demon mm. and is terrifying. And we basically we see him burning his own house down and coming out and, and people arrest him. We see him getting jumped in prison and then burning everybody in the prison yard. And so he is feeling guilty and regretful and he doesn't want to do this anymore. And that is at least it is. A, uh, he has a characteristic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's the thing. That's the thing I could say about Diablo. All right, you ready for another one? Here's number five, I believe. <laughs> five uh, out of seven. All right, we yeah. uh, introduce Killer Croc. Mm -hmm. This is a huge mutant crocodile dude that eats people. Oh, that's one thing that's in the extended edition. Yeah, he eats somebody. A lot of just a lot of talk about him being a cannibal. Mm. They bring it up. They bring it up repeatedly. Like every all the other characters are like, oh, you know, he eats people. And why? Oh, does really? He... Yeah, it's and they cut it completely out of the movie, probably yeah. because people aren't really that excited about cannibalism yeah, these days. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a it's a big issue. It's basically gun, <laughs> oh, guns, yeah, it's... there's guns in school, and then there's and then there's cannibalism. It's very hot button these days. Yeah. The, the crocodile <laughs> people. <laughs> All right, number six, Waller introduces Enchantress, who is the villain of the movie who does not make Ooh. sense. So as we as we talked about, she is an explorer in the Amazon or some goddamn thing. Dr. June Moon goes into a cave that's full of skulls, which is kind of like an Indiana Jones cave. And then she finds and immediately breaks some kind of artifact that releases like a, a female giggling smoke monster from Lost. <laughs> Her outfit is made out of cobwebs and black mold. Yeah, she's she's a witch from the past somehow, and she was mm -hmm. apparently worshipped as a goddess, but basically she just looks like a, a trash bag lady. Black smoke is constantly just kind of like emanating from her somehow. She's very weird looking. She's got scraggly hair. She's mostly mm -hmm. naked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she jumps into June's mouth. <laughs> and now she's sharing a body with June. Yeah. And she can do witch stuff. Actually, I have a little backstory for her because oh, yeah? um, in the comics, they're, they're a lot more clear about this stuff. She's The Enchantress is like a, a Mesoamerican ancient goddess. Mm -hmm. So presumably this, this cave was in like Central America or something like that. Right. And then uh, I froze it when the, the text on screen with her backstory, it says that she's 6,373 6, years old. And her brother, Incubus, is currently in a jar. <laughs> yes. So that, who knows these things that are coming up on screen? That's a very good question. Is that an omniscient narrator? Is that Waller? Well, does I mean, Waller? Waller does doesn't Wall know about her brother. I don't know. That's a really good point. Yeah. Of course, I don't think we're really meant to take in all that stuff unless you... It goes by super fast. Yeah. So Waller explains this part. I don't really follow. She had a team go to that same cave and search for the witch's secret buried heart, which is some kind of like clay vegetable spiky thing. It's like a it's basically like a really weird potato. It's like a moldy turnip. Yeah. And yeah, Waller yeah. owns it now and she carries it around <laughs> Yeah, in a suitcase, in a suitcase. And she thinks that it gives her control over the witch, but it doesn't actually yeah. at yeah. all. I, I would say June. Without when she's not in witch mode, I would say June is the worst character in the movie. Like, except for there's Deadshot's little daughter who I hate, and then there's <laughs> no. and then there's June. She has no jokes. She's very serious and breathless and upset all the time. And I mm -hmm. I am not fond of June. 
there there are times in this movie where I am expected to give a shit about June, and that those moments do not work for me. Well, you can you can see what Flag is seeing in her, right? Well, she's pretty. Yeah, <laughs> she's very pretty. I'm sorry, I didn't I actually didn't give her uh, you know enough space to to explain how how pretty she is. So that's nice. <laughs> No, I, yeah, I have no. Yeah, it would be. It would have been nice to see Flag and her, like, meet. Yes. Or or spend any time together. Really. That happens. That happens in the novelization. I imagine that that happens, like, in the original cut. Yeah, because the movie implies that Waller set this all up, right? Yeah. So here's like here's Flag is now the seventh <laughs> introduction in a row. They introduce Rick Rick Flag. He's an expert in special ops, which is a movie thing that I think means he's just good at everything in general. He's good at guns. He's good at climbing ropes. He he can probably <laughs> fly a helicopter. He orders people. He can do a lot of things very well, and he's very bossy. Uh, he's good at having two different haircuts throughout this movie. <laughs> Does he? I didn't. Yes. Uh, I never noticed the haircuts. That might be that might be our our key to the whole. What was a reshoot and what? Oh, wasn't. definite. It's definitely a reshoot thing because in some scenes he's got slicked back hair. Yeah. And then later he's got a spiked up buzz cut. Yeah. Oh, I wish it's. I'm so frustrating that I that I always miss that stuff. <laughs> So, yeah, so Flag has fallen in love with June, and Waller is very happy about that because it kind of keeps them both tied to Task Force X. I tried to freeze frame all of those uh, background graphics. Yeah. And it's very important to note that Colonel Rick Flag golfs a three handicap. Oh, that's nice. Oh, good. Good for him. He finds the, he finds the time. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't see that. <laughs> He's good at everything. <laughs> he really is special ops. That's why Scott Eastwood is in love with him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, you think that's a, a sub? You're I. Oh, I didn't notice I that, that either. No, and I, I think you're right. I I think that's just his Scott Eastwood's eyes are just always like that. He's like <laughs> a puppy. <laughs> Now, once they've told us about a substantial fraction of the cast, Waller and Rick Flagg and June all go to this big important meeting with the Joint Chiefs of the United States, where Waller's trying to convince them to authorize her organizing these weird supervillains into a team. The Joint Chiefs are mm-hmm. skeptical, as naturally they would be. So Waller, so Waller calls on June to turn into Enchantress and do a trick. Mm-hmm. And Waller is carrying around the witch's heart, this little green spoiled potato, in a little briefcase so that she can control this process. So so now we see the transformation happens when June says the word enchantress. She doesn't really want to do it, but Waller says she's supposed to. So June says enchantress. And then there's this super creepy transformation effect. Mm -hmm. And then the enchantress disappears and she goes and steals a big binder from the weapons ministry vault in Tehran. And brings it back. And the Joint Chiefs are very impressed with this. It's the only useful thing that she does in the movie, I think. And they say that they'd specifically been trying to get that binder. <laughs> yes. Or those those plant. This they is, knew about that one specifically. This is one of two very important binders in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's a, lot, yeah. there's a lot of important paperwork. There's they, 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 they believe in hard copies in the Suicide Squad. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> So Waller says she wants June back now and Enchantress doesn't want to turn back. And so Waller does this thing that happens several times where she takes the heart, the witch's heart, and she just like pokes it with a pen. It's so bizarre. Like just she goes and she just like pokes it Mm. and that hurts the Enchantress. And so she turns back into June. And after that unbelievably weird display, the Joint Chiefs are like, sure, go ahead. (laughs) You you are authorized. You go ahead and, and run this group. It's the silliest idea in the world. Also, they're talking about, you know, if we if Superman went bad, yeah, we need a team. Nobody on this team could stop Superman. No, that is very true. And maybe the witch because Superman and magic, but still stretch. The amount of effort that it takes to get this specific group of people together and trained and on task and to get them to do something. It does feel like maybe she could find some different metahumans. Who are easier to work with. Yeah. What, well, I, I was going to say, why is Harley Quinn on this team? But it's because she's she's <laughs> the, the only good character. Movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Besides Slipknot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he is fantastic. I have to say. Shot for shot, he delivers. Slipknot is so important that they don't mention him at no. 
Even though they introduce these characters multiple times. Yes. They we, they don't introduce him before, after, or during. We got to get this moving. So Waller and Rick and June show up at the Bell Rev prison for a get in the band together montage where Waller visits Harley's cage and Rick goes and talks to Killer Croc. And then there's a whole scene with Diablo who's locked up in a, a gas tank. Where is he locked up? He's he's repeatedly insisted that he's not dangerous. There's no way they captured him without him going peacefully, right? I mean, yeah, no, he gave he gave himself up because he was feeling guilty about his wife and kids. Mm-hmm. He is actually, I think, the one character who has something like a character arc. If a character arc is like he has a feeling now and then later on he has a slightly different feeling. This is followed by a really not good scene where the Joker is somewhere in some basically empty room. He's he's lying on the floor. Yeah. Surrounded by knives. He has this kind of like arts and crafts project. It's it, this it's a weird image and it doesn't really connect to anything. So while we're here, so now let's let's talk about let's talk about Jared and his and his mm-hmm. crazy. The thing that is funny about him and this part is that Jared Leto went all like method actor but not actually not this is not actually what method actor means. But no. he was just, like, completely exhausting during the entire production. He thought it was okay to just, like, inhabit the Joker as a character and then act like the Joker mm-hmm. all of the time. I mean, it was abusive is what it was. Yeah. Somebody, I forget who it was, somebody pointed out if Viola Davis or Margot Robbie or or, or any of the women in the cast mm-hmm. had done half of the shit that he did, they'd never work in Hollywood again. Everybody kind of, like said like well that's he's being method and he's he's not that big of a star there was a yahoo article where the reporter visited the set and i have this quote if we see him we're to call him mr j or smiley <laughs> we're also told to hope that doesn't happen <laughs> as for the uninitiated the experience could be intimidating <laughs> so jared is just walking around for the entire production just like terrifying people and acting completely insane and they treated him like he is a wild animal in a zoo (laughs) where you don't want to get too close to him there's i got another story about him like at at his costume fitting he told the costume designer i'm gonna be in character and she said like so sometimes he tried to terrify us but we're strong women he was growling at us and we'd play back which should not be necessary as no costume you should... designer's job description no that is unacceptable behavior from yeah anybody let alone a middling talent with <laughs> granted a, one oscar he's not a bad actor no but he's and not an he... amazing actor no it, it's just i remember when 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 he was first cast it was announced and it was like well that's interesting <laughs> right. He's a person I could see as the Joker. But you didn't say like, oh my God, I can't believe Jared Leto is going to be in this movie playing the Joker. Yeah. Which is how he's, that's how he's acting. And I just imagine like the costume designer, I have such sympathy, where she's saying like, dude, this is your fitting. Mm-hmm. We're trying to make you look, this is your costume. Just settle the fuck down. Like we're trying to make you, this is your, we're helping you right now. So Leto did, he did all of this ad lib stuff in every scene that he shot. He just was like the Joker and he did whatever came to his head. I have another quote. This is from one of the editors. For a lot of the material, we just couldn't find a purpose for it because sometimes he just go off on such crazy, insane tangents. It would be really hard to weave that into the film. Sometimes it just wasn't appropriate for what he was doing. (laughs) So he was just a nightmare. He was just like wasting everybody's time and intimidating people. And they can't even use the material that he is generating. I mean, fair's fair. He is inhabiting the Joker role. Yeah, but of be of being unbearable. Yeah, <laughs> and and of course there are the stories of what like the things that he mailed to his co-stars. You want to do that? I don't even want to talk about it. But I mean, <laughs> he did it, right? Yeah, he admitted to doing it. Yeah, but his people who was he wasn't even working with. He shares he shares scenes with none of these other actors except for Margot Robbie, and yep. God knows what he did to her. The thing that's crazy is this is not what method acting means. <laughs> method acting is the way that you prepare emotionally for a scene and you get like in touch with your motivation and your emotion and then you bring that to the performance. It's not a license to be so self-absorbed that you <laughs> overwhelm everybody else's process and you make mm-hmm. the set feel unsafe yeah. for other people who also need to prepare for their role. 
Yeah, it's a distraction to everyone you work with. Yeah. At at best. If not intimidating and frightening and makes the set feel unsafe. Yeah. It's my understanding that David Ayer in, encourages a method approach. Yeah. Like he gets his cast together and they spend time and they bond and, yeah, and they things do. like that. But it's like there is no actor who is less method than Will Smith. <laughs> yes, that is true. And he crushes it in every scene of this movie. Yeah, yeah. So I think You're there's a flaw. Right. I think there's a flaw in the method. Yeah, that's a good call. <laughs> All right, we are at the end of the first act. We are close to the end of the first act. We need some kind of inciting incident, or this movie is not going to get anywhere. Mm. So they create this completely random situation, which I don't really entirely understand. Where it's nighttime, and June is sleeping, I guess, and she just says "enchantress" for basically no reason. So she just says Enchantress, and then she becomes the spooky dumpster witch. (laughs) She teleports into a different room, where I believe that Waller has the other clay statuette. Oh, okay, the one with her brother in it. Yeah, and so that contains this other evil spirit thing, which is Enchantress's brother, whose name, I understand from Wikipedia and not from the movie, is Incubus. Yeah, it's not in the movie. So she touches this action figure and breaks it, and it goes out into the world And it possesses an entirely random adult man. So now brother is free. And there's a little discussion between sister and brother in some made up language about why humans don't worship them like gods anymore. And the answer to that question is because you're ridiculous and you look terrible. (laughs) Who would who would worship these people like gods? You're covered in cobwebs. Yeah. And I can only assume smell terrible. (laughs) So she says she's going to build a machine that will destroy the world. And then she goes back to Rick and she turns back into June. And there is no real motivation for anything that happens. So then the guy who's possessed by brother has a seizure sort of on a Mm -hmm. subway platform. Mm -hmm. And he suddenly grows these evil tentacles and grabs some people and rolls them up into like a Katamari ball. (laughs) And then it, like grabs the subway rail and starts messing around with electricity. And now there's an enormous monster who can, who can destroy a subway train. Finally, an actual plot point that threatens to move the story forward a step, get our antiheroes out in the field, doing something that anti matters. (laughs) So this is the end of act one of suicide squad. I will be releasing act two later on this week. And here's what's coming up. This is entirely unnecessary for a movie that employs actors. He's just a guy who just shows up out of nowhere and punches a woman in the face. And that's... The first thing he does in the movie. Yeah. It's not easy to, to recognize these little plot points when they occur because they look just like everything else. Yeah. Somebody said every Comic-Con for the next 20 years, <laughs> there will be girls dressed like this. And this is what I want to see. <laughs> But she already is doing her worst. Like, literally everybody involved in this production is doing their worst. They've been doing it the whole time. All right, so stay tuned for that. Thank you, Evan. (laughs) Thank you. I will meet you right back here for Act 2 of Suicide Squad, here on the Superheroes Everyday Podcast. Thanks for listening. Huh? What was that? I should kill everyone and escape? Sorry. The voices. <laughs> I'm kidding. Jeez. That's not what they really said.